From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Startling new revelations in the 38 Studios case. Target 12 uncovered court documents that completely alter the narrative of how the controversial deal came to be. State lawyers say former House Speaker Gordon Fox had an undisclosed meeting with key players from the video game company and that he ordered economic development officials to work a deal to get 38 Studios to Rhode Island. The findings are sparking renewed calls for an independent investigation. Our guests this week on Newsmakers, Ken Block from Watchdog Rhode Island and Mike Stenhouse of the Rhode Island Center for Freedom and Prosperity. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel is WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Ken Block, Mike Stenhouse, welcome to the program. It's good to have both of you here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So reporters always like it when uh, people notice their work and they react to it. Uh, but what was it about this uh, this report that we filed this week that uh, resonated with you to the point where you felt that you had to throw a news conference and take action? Yeah. Ken? 38 Studios is an unhealed wound for the state of Rhode Island. For five years, no one has explained adequately to the taxpayers how this deal came to pass, why it came to pass, and what we can do to ensure that this kind of fiscal disaster doesn't happen again. When you came out with the story that essentially indicated to us that former disgraced speaker Gordon Fox lied about his involvement and what he knew and when, that told me that this was the perfect opportunity to insist on transparency and openness and insist that our government, and especially a new government that we have now, get out the truth about what happened so we can move forward. And we should point out that we've reached out to Gordon Fox's attorneys and they haven't, uh, he hasn't returned our call uh, for a comment. Those things came, as we said at the top of the show, in, in court documents in the civil suit. All right, so what are you looking for from state leaders here? Transparency and answers. Because after five years, the fact that we don't have answers about how this happened, uh, especially from the previous governor who was about to chain himself to the conference table to prevent 38 Studios from happening, he, Governor Chafee at the time never provided the answers to us and kept them all enclosed in within his office, right? He obviously had access to a bunch of the information that we think should be public about this deal, and he never brought it out and made it public. Uh, and that's really the problem. This was an insider's deal. There's no question about it. We want to know who the people were, what they did to make this happen, and how do we prevent it from ever happening again? Mike, one question. One, you know, obviously Tim and I also still find 38 Studios interesting. We wouldn't have done the story, but. I, to be honest, one reaction you do get from people is, what are we trying to find out at this point, right? You know, we, we all know it was a bad deal in Rhode Island. We all know there was backroom politics involved in it. Yeah. What's left to find yeah. out? I mean, what do you say to people who are kind of fatigued by this? Well, for me, the reaction, and I'll circle back to your question. For me, the reaction that your story uh, helped solidify was this almost on paper, this conspiracy between the legislative branch, potentially the executive branch, and a quasi-public organization to basically defraud taxpayers, even to defraud the own, their own members of the General Assembly into getting a special interest insider deal through. Uh, and it really made it stark to me, you know, to see your report. And it's a larger symptom, I believe, the 38 Studios, of, of the culture up there is that we've got to take care of our friends at the expense of the taxpayer. It's not just 30. I mean, 30 students is a big problem. We'll talk about that. But there are other, other problems up there. We, we seem to think that economic development is cronyism, that if we give tax breaks to this company or this industry, that that somehow is economic development in and of itself. And that's a wrong culture. That's what's killing our state right now. So, circling back to your question, which was basically that people are saying we we know oh, there's okay. not a lot left to find so, out. So, in so it's to expose, but to expose it to make an example of it to discourage that kind of activity in the future. So you brought up the General Assembly, and I want to bring up a statement from Speaker Mattiello, and that's because one of the four items you're looking for, besides a, an independent investigation called by the governor, is you want subpoena power to the House Oversight Committee so they can uh, continue their probe, I guess, but with subpoena power into uh, 38 Studios. And Speaker Mattiello, Mattiello released a statement, and it says in part, the newest allegation about Fox's involvement in the 38 Studios deal does not change the fact that the General Assembly is not an investigative body. Ken, what do you say to that? They have the ability to provide subpoena power to committees, so I would argue that if they choose to, they can, in fact, 
be an investigative body. And because this deal was born out of the legislative process, uh, and because so many legislators themselves feel like they were hoodwinked by what this deal was and they didn't understand what they were voting for, I would hope and expect that a great many members of the General Assembly have an interest in vetting this internally and getting the truth out. Yeah, fine. But, and Mike, I'll put this to you because hypercritical of the legislature and you say it was born out of it. How, why would you want the very um, group that you say launched this whole sour deal to investigate themselves? Why would that instill confidence uh, in, the, in, in people about an investigation if they're the ones conducting it? Well, it certainly is idealistic a little bit for me to say that, I would think. But why do we have a House Oversight Committee then, if, if not to look into matters that happen within a sense? Why would we even discuss having ethics in reform if, if we're not going to have some level of self-policing? Uh, listen, we shouldn't accept it, but I think we all understand that corruption and, and breaking the process, as Ken has often talked about, you know, will happen and has happened in this case. And, and, if, and if you have confidence that you can self-police yourself, I think that restores some of the trust in government. Yes, people are human and they're going to make mistakes, but you know what? They've got to be exposed. They've got to be held accountable to the voters to decide whether or not they want that person in or not. And if, they're, and if through Chairwoman Macbeth's committee we can do some measure of that, I think that would really actually raise up the status of the General Assembly. But Chairwoman Macbeth, uh, you know, she wanted to do the subpoena power, and, and Speaker Mattiel hasn't. And I haven't seen much pushback in the legislature. The, pe the Speaker is very powerful, obviously, but I mean, isn't it up to the lawmakers themselves to, to tell the Speaker this is something they demand? Well, I, I did speak with the Chairwoman last week, uh, and she made two points. She said, listen, our committee has pretty much reached a dead end given the limitations we have. But two of the requests in our, in our four points would help her. One, a document release from the, 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 the investigation that's going on at the court or the hearing that's going on The up civil there. suit. Right. So we've called on unsealing all the documents. It was one unsealed document that led to your revelation. Imagine if we unsealed all the documents, right? So that would give her committee new life, plus subpoena power. So we're recalling uh, for, for the speaker to, to, to give life back to that committee. Chairman Macbeth is ready to move forward if she has something new to look at. But right now, they've reached a dead end. So... That's why we have two of these four points. Ken, um, so you hold a big press conference this week with uh, multiple organizations, um, and uh, you know you you, you, you demand these four things. What's next? We are uh, hopefully by the end of the weekend, more likely probably sometime next week, we'll have a website available where uh, taxpayers and residents of Rhode Island can go to it, and they can launch an email to Governor Raimondo, to Speaker Mattiello. Uh, asking them for full transparency on 38 Studios, uh, asking for an independent, they're basically asking for our four points minus the judge. And uh, we also will be asking individual legislators to go on the record on whether they believe that we should also have a transparent reporting and accounting of exactly what happened with 38 Studios. Uh, and between the public pressure and hopefully internally within the legislature by asking the members uh, to put pressure on leadership, we're hoping that we can actually move the, the process and get the answers that we're looking and for. And I might quickly add that that tactic is what was so successful in moving the Master Lever issue, that, right. that exact same kind of website. So Well, well Master Lever, that, yeah. 38 Studios, we're talking about two very different things here. And so I, I'm curious about how you're going to apply pressure to members of the General Assembly. So you're going to ask them individually, I assume? Correct. Okay, so look, I've been down this road in my reporting, and uh, frankly, uh, you know, sometimes top down, the answer is just don't respond. What happens? I mean, there, there could be just there, a goose egg for you on this one, Ken, uh, except there, for a couple. There, of there could be, but this, is, uh, this session is in front of an election year, and uh, it doesn't look good for any representative or senator to be trying uh, to publicly sidestep an issue as important as this one was, and, and you, the mood of the electorate is still remains ugly when it comes to 38 Studios. People are angry that we lost $100 million roughly uh, in this failed deal and that we don't understand how it happened. Uh, it won't be hard to get a good chunk of the population really upset about this again. Uh, and I believe that the pressure on individual members uh, can really help to put pressure ultimately on the, on leadership. I, 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 I wonder though, or maybe I have to push back a little because you know I've, I cover we cover elections every two years, and and one of the most striking things since 38 Studios happened to me has been the 
that there hasn't been much evidence that voters care a lot, to be honest. I mean, I, I particularly I think of Dawson Hodgson's run for AG, where he focused so much on the lack of any law enforcement effort on 38 Studios. Uh, Peter Kilmartin still won very easily that race. In the General Assembly, you know, all these people who supported Gordon Fox had very little trouble staying in power. I mean, is there, do people, maybe just voters, not care as much as you two think, Mike? Boy, I, I don't, I, I would disagree with that. I mean, I think the same anger that Ken talked about with 38 Studios is real. I think it has what has led to the anger about the 38 Stadium, if you would. You know, the Pawtucket Red Sox Stadium. I think it's, we do not want another 38 Studios debacle. We do not want this Pawtucket Red Sox Stadium relocation to turn into that. And we know that currently that anger is broad and it's passionate and it's deep and it's causing politicians to take a second look at the issue and I think it all stems from the 38 Studios uh, issue. So I think there are great lessons to learn from 38 Studios which is I think why Ken and I want to capitalize on that, make an even bigger example out of it to discourage that kind of activity again in the future. Ken, um, we're taping this on a Friday. On Thursday I was on the phone with former Governor Don Kachiri. Um, he couldn't comment too much on it. Uh, he said that, you know, look, I might get called to testify at the, at the civil trial, but he did confirm uh, for us that he was asked about this meeting Gordon Fox had with key players from 38 Studios before the fundraiser uh, during his his deposition, uh, where Ted and I are obviously very eager to to read the the depositions and that to find out more. But with Governor Kachiri, um, clearly he was a cheerleader of this. Um, everyone always thought that that chance meeting between him and Schilling that was that's what sparked all of, all of this. Do you think this vindicates him in any way? Uh, it's really hard to draw any conclusions on anybody at this point because we really don't have, we have dribs and drabs of information, we really don't have uh, enough of what we need. We do know that the EDC overwhelmingly approved 38 Studios and, and the EDC is an executive branch. Uh, of which uh, closet, he chaired. Of which he chaired. So, uh, you know, I'm not so much interested in, in casting the blame at this point as I am in just understanding how it all went down. Uh, that's, I think, the most important thing. You know, to come back to the Pawtucket, the Pawtucket uh, Red Sox stadium real quick, my personal belief is that people are so burned and so leery of the insider behind closed doors kind of deal making that gave us 30, 38 studios that they don't trust the process, they don't trust our elected officials to do right by them but with the stadium. But there are things going on. We have the civil suit. That's where Ted found the document at court. Yeah. So, we, you know, we're getting stuff out of that. Hopefully those depositions are released. And the state police say there is an ongoing investigation that is under review by the attorney general's office. Why not see what fruit comes from that? Because oh, there's two aspects of the story. There's the criminal aspect. Which, which is going on, or the civil aspect, which is going on in court. And then there's the insider game political aspect, which we think is proper for Chairwoman of Macbeth's committee. So not necessarily criminal. Right. We don't have to, you know, how was the game played? Who were the players? What strings did they pull? What pressure did they apply? And how, like Ken said, how did it happen? So, so we don't have to make every, put everything in the lens of, of, of criminal. And that's why I believe the governor's position on this is just flat out kicking the can down the road. To say that we have to wait for the criminal or civil trials to end before we can look at anything else, that's wrong. In Washington, D.C., we've got, you know, we got a House committee looking at the Benghazi email gate, and we've got the FBI looking at, you know, the Clinton email gate. They're going on simultaneously, so that is, that is a false argument that we have to wait for one before we can do that. And next. I just want to say, it's been five years, Yeah. right? I mean, it's been a very long time and we don't have these answers. So as, as a citizen, I look at that and I say, obviously there's a lot of people who don't want this to happen because otherwise, if there was truly a, a, a drive and a push to understand this and vet it and get it out there, it should have been out already. We gotta take a break. Our guests this week are Ken Block from Watchdog Rhode Island and Mike Stenhouse from the Rhode Island Center for Freedom and Prosperity. When we come back, we're gonna talk about the center's opposition to HPV, firefighter schedules, and politics, politics, politics. Stay with us. <laughs> You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, Ted Nisi from WPRI.com. And our guests this week, Ken Block from Watchdog Rhode Island and Mike Stenhouse from the Rhode Island Center for Freedom and Prosperity. Ken, in your campaign against Alan Fung in 2014, you were very critical of how he handled the Cranston police situation. Now, a state police report is... Uh, 
also very highly critical of Fung, saying he politically interfered at the department. We had him on the show last week. He denied that, uh, but that uh, that was a scathing state police report. No question about it. There are calls for him to resign as mayor, should he? Uh, I believe it was in your debate uh, that I uh, claimed that the Cranston police scandal, based on what we knew about it at the time, uh, was a disqualifying factor for uh, Mayor Fung to, to be governor. Uh, I believe that what came out in the state police report uh, backs up that statement. Uh, you know, look, I can't speak, nor do I have any interest in getting involved in the local politics of Cranston. Uh, I think that it's really up to the voters of that city to decide what it is they want to do or not do. I think they have to look at how much this has cost, how effective the mayor could be moving forward, and whether they want that kind of governance moving into the future. Would you have been the nominee if that report came out in the fall? I believe very strongly I would have been, yes. Do you feel vindicated? Vindicated? No, I don't think there's any vindication involved here. Uh, I'm certainly disappointed it took so long for the report to come out. Uh, frankly, if I had that kind of thing in my background, I never would have run in the first place. Why? Because that, because eventually it oh, comes in, in out. your background. If, if it was in I my see. background, I would not ever have considered running. Okay. Ted. Mike, um, I wanted to ask you about something that struck me months ago when I was covering the budget debate. And your group, uh, since you came on scene, very critical, as you showed in the first half, of, of sort of the, the general policy thrust of Rhode Island and the ruling Democrats here. And yet budget night, three hours, very short debate, and then unanimous approval even from the Republicans. What was your reaction to that? Well, Justin Katz, who, as you may know, writes for our uh, journalism wing, the Ocean State Current, a real, real good piece, you know, expressing his disappointment, and we share it, that, that, that there was no loyal opposition. Even in, even in a healthy democracy, you have good, open, rigorous debate. You need, you know, there's obviously a, a ruling class or a ruling party, and there always needs to be the loyal opposition. We feel that's our role is to provide, you know, uh, the other side of the story, the other side of the debate that often doesn't get out. So we were very disappointed that the Republican Party has a strategy. Uh, you know, they just feel if we go along and get along, maybe the speaker or somebody will throw us a crumb. Uh, you know, I think you've got to stand for, for what you believe in. You've got to have principles. And if those principles are violated, you should never compromise those. That's the beauty of our center is we can, we can stick by our principles. There's no political downside. There's no risk. In fact, when we stand by our principles, our donors like it even better. So, so we understand there's politics at play, but it was very discouraging to us to think that there's not even going to be a loyal opposition. But the, it, and then, uh, so this is a great segue uh, for me. Uh, what the, the budget process I've always claimed is really quite broken. Most legislators don't have an ability to review the finished budget until it's too late. Once the budget was passed and was signed into law, it was already several tens of millions of dollars more in the red than it was when it, when it came out. And this is why I believe very strongly Rhode Island needs a governor's light item veto, like 44 other states have in our country. Right now, our governor doesn't have the ability to take individual elements of the budget and strike them out. We could have balanced the budget right then and there had the governor exercised light item veto capabilities and, and brought our budget into balance, which by law it must be. You know, well, I talked to some of the Republicans after the debate, and they, they said, uh, the, debate, the, the budget debate, and they said, look, we, we, got, we had wins in this budget. You know, we got changes to, uh, to, the, to tax rates. We got the Social Security exemption. We got uh, the taxes are slightly lower now than they are. We're going into Medicaid. I mean, they saw that as, as some policy wins for the, the, the right side of the political spectrum. Do you, do you see that there? Well, yeah, I mean, you accept the wins, but that doesn't mean you have to uh, make it a win-lose. You don't have to get a few wins at the expense of something else. You should fight for your wins, be happy when you get your wins, but keep fighting against, uh, against bad things, too. Uh, you know, this horse trading kind of mentality that happens up there on Smith Hill all the time is, is not healthy, whether it's done within a party or whether it's done intra-party. Uh, or inter, whatever the right So, so... I mean, I agree with half of what they said, but but not the. I don't think in that case the ends justify the means. Yeah. Mike, stick with you here. Your organization objects to the requirement that seventh graders get the HPV vaccine. Why? Yeah, two simple reasons. First, it's our mission to preserve economic, educational, individual freedoms. This is clearly an infringement on parental rights and student rights when you're forced to take an invasive 
uh, vaccine in an environment where this particular uh, disease, the HPV virus, can't be transmitted in a classroom environment. So, so that's our first position. The second is what we talked about earlier, is the process by which this mandate happened. It happened without any legitimate public debate. It happened without any oversight by the General Assembly. One person in a former administration, the former Director of Health, almost by executive fiat, was able to implement this. Forty other states have looked at this by commissions. Well, I don't know if it's 40. Multiple dozen other states have looked at this by commission or by somebody introducing legislation. And once they studied it and had a public debate, they all decided not to do it. Well, the General Assembly could do that. They could. They well, could. they could do it after the fact now, and there are sure. legislators who are going to try to post-fix this. But the fact that this happened in the dark, once again, with some individual without that public or legislative oversight is the second reason we oppose it. You know, health officials here will say, look, there is a mechanism for parents to get their kids out of it. They, they can do an exemption, a religious exemption. They can get an exemption from their doctor. Well, let me um, tell you where we are now. We've got, the, we've got the health department now saying, well, we, we're going to backtrack and not keep any kid out of school who doesn't have the mandate. So, we're, A, we're not going to enforce it. B, since there's no philosophical, they took away the philosophical exemption many decades ago or years ago, there's only religious exemption. They're saying, well, if you don't like it, use the religious exemption. So if you're encouraging people to opt out, if you're saying we're not going to enforce it, then let's end the charade and not even have a mandate in the first place, and that's what we're calling on the governor to end, because she's the only one that can end it right now. Ken, you've been working a lot on uh, firefighter pay to the dismay of the fire unions mm -hmm. based on our Twitter feeds. I'm aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what you think from the research you've done of Mayor Lorz's move, uh, this big fight over the platoon move that yeah. has gone from 42 to 56 hours. What do you think? So uh, when we studied firefighting costs in Rhode Island relative to other places, we determined that the cost of fire in Rhode Island is anywhere from 33% to 100% more expensive than anywhere else we could find. Our shift schedules are part of driving that cost. When you have four platoons of firefighters, you need 25% more firefighters than you do with three platoons. So that helps to explain a big part of our cost driver right there. Is Mayor Alorza correct in trying to move to a three platoon system? Generally speaking, I agree. The answer, I believe the answer to that is emphatically yes. The majority of career fire departments in Rhode Island have some form of a three platoon system. So the fact that Rhode Island has mostly four makes us an outlier relative to most other places. So I, I think the, the general idea is right. I think that the actual execution of how to get there leaves a lot to be desired. Is it about minimum manning, though? I mean, each of the four platoons, they'll have 100 uh, firefighters on. Uh, the minimum manning is 94. So isn't it more of a staffing issue than well, anything else? So one of the questions that I would ask, a basic question, is why is the man minimum manning 94? Is 94 the right number? Should the number be lower? And well, that's then, what and I'm then, saying. Right, is should, that what the mayor should be exploring? Well, I, I think that's, uh, it makes perfect sense to go down that road because we all know that at night it's less busy than during the day. So if it's quieter at night, can you get by with a lower staffing level than 94? So there's real basic things that I think need to be investigated uh, along with on, on Providence's municipal borders with other towns where they have two fire departments, fire stations very close to each other. Do we really need both of those staffed all the way and can we figure out some way to share resources and reduce costs? So based on your answer to Ted, it sounds like you support the schedule of 10 hour a day, 10 hour day, then two 14 hour overnights. No, the, the, the standard three platoon system across the country, most of them are 24 hours on, 48 hours off. Uh, firefighters like that schedule. That's the safest schedule in terms of injuries. If I by the way, the, the they, most dangerous schedule is the second 14 hour night. That's when most of the injuries occur, according to the, to the documentation I've seen. Okay. Um, so I got to ask you politics now because I've said it three times going into the break. Um, you know, both of you, how, how do you think Governor Raimondo is doing? <clears throat> I think that uh, there are things that are happening that have come out in the media that make me heartened. Uh, there are a number of individuals who have been put on paid administrative leave. Uh, I believe that they're looking very carefully at how they're staffed, how effective some of the individuals are who are in government. And uh, it was necessary. Going into DCYF is necessary. Uh, uh, going into DOT and really going through it carefully, uh, highly necessary. These are all things that are happening. Looking at Eleanor Slater Hospital. Uh, is something that in my waste and fraud report we identified as an issue that had to be looked at. Should we even have an Illinois Slater Hospital? So these are all things that I, I uh, approve of and I agree with. Uh, you know, she's still, uh, her administration is still very new and still really just getting up to speed right now. It's really going to be the next six months, in my opinion, that will really tell the tale on how effective they're going to be able to be. 
What do you think of Donald Trump's uh, <laughs> success so far? So. I have two thoughts on that. The first one is he's been brilliant at acquiring the 25% of the, of the vote that he's got right now. The question is, if, if for him to go higher, he's going to have to pivot and prove to all the doubters that he is, in fact, electable and that he can govern. He's a so yeah. uh, so he's, what he's done right now is what he had to do to get to where he is. Uh, if he stays on the same path, he can't possibly win. If he, if he pivots at some point and becomes a statesman, he's brilliant. Well, you want to weigh in? 40 seconds left. Uh, do you want to weigh in on that? What do you think of and the Trump phenomenon? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I think he's got to prove to me and to others that he can be a statesman. You know, it's one thing to be a hard businessman. You know, politics and government isn't necessarily business, but, but uh, certainly as the leader of the free world, you need to be a really good statesman. And that's what he's got to prove to me. I'm, I'm glad that he's bringing up some of these issues. I'm glad that he's pushing back against the corrupt status quo in Washington, D.C. Uh, but but I, has we need a statesman. Very, very briefly, has it surprised you how, how well he's done? Yeah, I think it, what surprised me is the fact that he's appealing to a lot of blue-collar, in-the-middle, non-political people. That, that's surprising because they can't be any opposite in, in terms of status, right, yeah. stature. Mike Stenhouse, Rhode Island Center for Freedom and Prosperity. Ken Block, Watchdog Rhode Island, thank you for joining us. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. If you missed any of it, it's online. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.